So if we can get started with that, and of course if you'd like to drop a phone call, just give me a call at 705-739-1056. So I'm just going to boot up a new computer. I just threw something together here for us tonight. And we're going to just demonstrate kind of the Linux operating system, how we can install this. And eventually what we're actually going to do is next week we're going to actually add uh, Windows XP to that Linux desktop operating system and create a virtual environment so that you can be running the two operating systems simultaneously. So if we just fire up this computer here, there's currently nothing on the hard drive. And I'm just going to boot directly from CD. First thing that we want to do when we're doing this kind of setup is you want to go into your BIOS, make sure that your boot device is set to your CD-ROM drive. If that's set, you can save those settings and you're good to go. So now we're going to be booting directly from, we're going to be working with PC Linux OS today. PC Linux OS is a Debian-based operating system, very similar to Ubuntu or Ubuntu. It's a free operating system. You can download it at PCLinuxOS.com. The reason that I've chosen to go with this instead of Ubuntu today is because of the fact that uh, integration of the NVIDIA drivers, ATI drivers, proprietary drivers that, uh, that aren't distributed directly with Linux, uh, is very easy to install in PC Linux OS. As well as that, it includes the Barrel project, so it gives us a chance to very quickly install the operating system, get things set up and up and running in uh, in such a way that uh, is practical within a one-hour show. So that's just booting up. We'll be able to install this operating system, if you can believe it. If you've ever installed Windows XP, you'll be shocked when I tell you that in about five minutes we're going to be booting this computer up and uh, we'll have this operating system completely installed on, on the hard drive, which is currently blank. The initial boot up process takes a little longer because we're booting from a CD-ROM and of course that's quite a slow medium. We can see that that's just continuing to load. That's going to take us right into a live desktop. In the meantime we can look at a couple of questions that are coming on our website. And of course if you haven't gone to the website yet it is simply www.tv.robbyf.com That's Robbie F short for Ferguson.com one of the questions that I've received uh, just through our website, people posting there, is uh, from Lore Lady, and she's asking what she needs in order to start an internet radio station. So that's a good question, and of course uh, it's a very vast question. I don't know if you realize the, the size of that question. Of course there's certain levels of uh, internet radio, and, and every single one requires different things. Essentially, when you're looking at internet radio, you need two things. You need a source stream and you need a server. The server is what's going to actually distribute the stream out onto the internet so that when the listeners connect, they've got something to listen to. Uh, however, the source is actually sending the stream to that server. Now we've got this. I'm going to come back to this question, Laura. In the meantime, I don't want to waste any time with this. We want to get this installing. So. The first question that we're getting here on our, uh, our new PC Linux OS computer is what kind of keyboard layout we have, which of course is going to be the US keyboard layout if we're just using a standard 101 key keyboard. Then it's asking what time zone I am. I'm going to choose Toronto, which is the eastern time zone. Automatically synchronize my time with the web server. And then it's just asking us to quickly configure our internet connection. All very straightforward. You can see I'm just pushing next a whole bunch of times essentially. There's nothing that I really as a user have to configure. Here it's asking me if I want to allow users to manage the connection. Because this is a, we're going to say this is a home computer, not a business computer, I'm going to allow my users to manage the Ethernet connection. So essentially that's their internet connection. They'll be able to change their IP address and things like that. I don't really want to restrict my users because it's just going to be used for home. So. We're going to hit start. Do I want to start the connection now? I say yes, and pretty much instantly you're going to see that we're... Now I'm just hearing the CD-ROM spin up, so again, the only cause of that delay was because of the CD-ROM. And it says, congratulations, the network and internet configuration is complete. So now I hit finish. Just have my mouse cursor, and we're already into the bootable version of the CD. Now you can see two user accounts here. If you've ever used Linux before, you'll be familiar with the root account. Root is essentially your administrator account. That allows you to configure the computer. As a guest user, you're not going to have any access to uh, configuring the computer settings. You'll be able to use the programs that are already installed, but you won't be able to change system settings. And that's why there's a root user account. And this is one of the reasons why Linux is so non-susceptible to viruses. 
uh, whereas Windows, uh, as a great example, always gets you know bombarded with viruses and adware and spyware because typically with those operating systems you are essentially always logged in as an administrator or a root user. With Linux, of course, if you're going to be surfing the internet, you're only going to be logged in as your guest user. The root user account we're going to go into, because we're just booting up from the CD, our root password is simply going to be root. This is different for every Linux distribution, but PC Linux OS um, shows us that, uh, that that's how we log in. And here we go, our first look at the PC Linux OS desktop. And again, it's loading from the CD, so it's going to take just a few extra moments longer than it would uh, normally. I'm also taking questions by MSN, TV dot Robbie, or beg your pardon, TV at RobbieF.com. The website is www.tv.robbieF.com. Going back to our PC Linux OS computer, this is all booted up and ready to go and we can again see that there's a little bit of a lag and that's because of the CD-ROM. So we quickly just want to install this operating system. Very simple button on the desktop, install PC Linux OS. Great thing about this though is the fact that we can boot up the disk, we can look at the operating system, see if we like it, we can surf the, the web with it, and we're not committed to installing that on, on our computer. So if I wanted to, I could just test out the operating system right now. I don't have to install it. So I could do this, I could test this operating system without ever letting it change anything on my hard drive. In this instance, we know that we want to do this, so we're just going to hit next. Now it's asking if I want to install it to a hard drive or a USB drive. I'm just going to choose hard drive. And, of course, erase and use the entire disk. You also have options of doing custom partitioning, but for the sake of this show, we're just going to use the default feature, which is going to wipe out our entire hard drive. So make sure if you have anything on that hard drive that you back that up before you do this. And it's asking if we want to, or it's just reminding us that we're going to be removing all partitions on the hard drive, and I'm just going to say next because I am fine with that. This hard drive is in fact blank, so no problem. Because it's mounted a new hard drive, it's going to bring you up this window here that's saying that it's found a new hard drive. We can just close out of that. We don't need it. And then it's uh, just prompting us, and again, hit next. Very straightforward, and it's just going to go through uh, formatting the partition and then it's going to allow us the chance to install the operating system. So looking back at the question that Laura had about internet radio, there are many services on the internet that are going to allow you to um, stream your internet radio station because at, as a residential user, you're not going to have the resources in order to, um, to stream a, a live web stream in that. It, just to give you an example, if you're using a DSL internet account or a high-speed cable account, uh, you may have between let's say 256 kilobits to 1.5 megabits of upstream uh, bandwidth and that's at any given time and that fluctuates depending on how many users there are on your internal network and how many people in your community are using the internet on some cases like cable. Um, so if you had let's say 15 different people listening to your web stream and you were trying to stream that through your home uh, internet service you're very very quickly going to run out of bandwidth and so all of a sudden this is where you start to see uh, skipping in your music. So, um, so there are services. Uh, a good one that comes to mind is called Live365.com. What Live365 does is they give you, as a residential user, a, a great chance to uh, to start streaming internet uh, radio. I'm just going to bring it up here, and it's just like it sounds. Live365, 365.com. And they've been in business for many years. And the advantage to them is that they're going to take care of your royalties for you. They're also going to allow you to um, set up an account. You're going to be able to demo the account and see if you like it before you commit to buying into the service. Of course, there's nothing like this that's going to be free. And the reason for that is because of the bandwidth that you're going to be using, as well as um, royalty rates that have to be paid out to the artists. So if we look up here, we've got, okay, right here is a button called uh, that says broadcast. So if I click on that button, we're going to get two options here. Start a personal radio station for individuals. This lets you broadcast your music. Very cool features of Live 365 is that you can actually upload your MP3s and it will automatically sort of put them in a playlist so it thereby eliminates the need for a source server. That's pretty cool if you're going to be just streaming your own, you know, your favorite MP3s, if you're going to be streaming, if you're an artist and you want to be streaming your own music. Uh, that's great. There's also the professional edition of Live 365, and this is going to cost a little bit more, obviously, uh, because it is the professional edition. It starts at about $200, but you can see the residential service 
gives you a free seven day trial and it starts at only nine ninety five a month so it's a definitely a good, w a good place to get started if you're new to internet radio uh, their service is quite excellent quite reliable and they, like I say they've been in the business uh, for many many years so many advantages to that uh, I hope that that answers your question Laura if you're online feel free to MSN me so that uh, because your question was from a few days ago uh, posted on our website I'd love to know if that answers your question specifically the question was it was pretty broad, uh, but I want to make sure that that takes care of you. Great starting place is live365.com. Looking back at our PC Linux OS computer, of course that, uh, during my little spiel there, it is already uh, ready to go, so I'm just going to hit next again to install. And this is just going to compute the space that it needs on the hard drive, and it's going to proceed to install that operating system, okay? So that's just going to start copying files over to the computer. There's nothing else for me to do. It's not going to ask me a ton of different questions, like Windows XP installation. Okay, let's see what we have here. Okay, I'm just looking at MSN here. Okay, looking at uh, Rachel's inquiry about uh, spyware and viruses. Um, if you could just respond to me, Rachel, and just let me know what you're currently running as protection. And then there's people just sending me random messages, so, okay. You can see the progress indicator is just proceeding. Got a couple more uh, canned questions here that have been brought in through the website. Uh, if anyone else does have a question for me, please feel free to MSN me the question directly at uh, tv at robbyf.com. Got a question coming in right now from Phil. Oh, that's again another personal question. Just asking if I'm involved with Barry Linux Users Group. Uh, Phil, no, I'm not uh, technically affiliated with uh, Barry Linux Users Group, and uh, I have been in touch with their directors there. Unfortunately, my schedule is just not allowed for it. In that it's every Wednesday night, and uh, usually weeknights are, are, as you can imagine, pretty hectic. The one weeknight that I get free, I start a television program. So, um, any other questions coming in here? So, waiting for a response from Rachel. Tyler is asking a question about how he can secure his identity on the internet. Tyler, if you're watching this right now, do you are you referring to uh, registering your own.com? Uh, perhaps increasing your, your uh, rankings in the search engines? How, how exactly do you mean with that question? Okay, so Tyler is asking specifically about surfing. Um, so, okay, you're going to be looking at many different, uh, different things here. Obviously, search engines are a big thing. These days, when people are using uh, advanced uh, web browsers such as Mozilla Firefox, uh, even the new Internet Explorer 7, I don't want to use that as an example, but the feature is there where users are beginning to now, and, and it's been a feature for quite some time, be able to um, simply enter uh, what, whatever their query is, almost like the old AOL search uh, terms, uh, directly into their address bar. So we're no longer having to remember um, web addresses and web URLs as much as we used to because the layman said, okay, well, I want to be able to just to type, it, type in what I want. So if I want, you know, web hosting, I want to be able to just type in web hosting and it will take me right to a website that's going to help me with that. So the way that that works is essentially a lot of the services are provided by Google. Of course, the, uh, the Internet Explorer uh, uh, side of things it tends to use the MSN search features. So you want to make sure that you're getting good rankings in both of those search engines. You want to make sure that your keywords on your website are uh, very focused on what it is that you're doing, and uh, and that way you're going to get a much better um, much better identity, as you as you say. Does that does that help with your question at all? <laughs> sort of, he says. Okay, what 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 more can I touch on? Of course, search engines are the big thing uh, that allow lay people, people who don't know your URL. Uh, to find your website. Of course, people who know your URL, you've already got them, it's fine. But it's the people who don't, people who are just searching for keywords. Uh, session cookies. OK, 
Okay, he's asking how about with session cookies on various server-based uh, service-based sites. Uh, you're going to have to explain exactly what you're what you're meaning there. Oh, do you mean protecting your identity? Thanks, Phil. Ah, okay. I, you said securing your identity, and so I meant I, I was under the impression that you were meaning securing your your corporate identity or your business identity. Um, Okay, so so you're you're wondering about cookies on websites, which are stored on your local computer, uh, not on not necessarily on the server. Um, is there a specific thing, a specific thing that concerns you about surfing the internet? Is it uh, your credit card number, things like that, or just just in general? Okay, so what Tyler's asking about here is uh, he's saying that some sites don't um, don't set their session cookies to expire. Now, for those of you who don't know what a session cookie is, that's when you go to a website and you enter any amount of information, and that website is programmed to save that information to your computer directly, so that next time you go there, you don't have to answer that question again. So it's a very handy feature, but sometimes it's been used maliciously. Uh, I think Tyler, probably the best thing for you to look at is, of course, software. Uh, protection. Um, a great product that you can look at is Panda Internet Security 2007. Uh, now, I should ask which operating system you're running, because um, I'm the Firefox plugin. Now, I haven't. Uh, Tyler's asking if there's a Firefox plugin that would do this for him. I'm just going to take a look here. I mean, the almighty Google comes into play. For the most part, I find that cookies are, are relatively safe. I mean, there is, of course, you have the fear that your your information being stored anywhere is going to be um, is going to be used against you. But the fact is, is that cookies can only store in the information that you give them. Um, when you surf the internet, there there is certain information about you that is sent to the server every single time you visit a website. That information um, usually is not identifying, other than the fact that now, usually, what we can see as as uh, web hosts is uh, the username that you're logged into your computer as, uh, the type of operating system, what version of the operating system you're using. We can see what browser version you're using, and uh, a little bit of information about your connection, including your IP address. And based on your IP address, we can do a trace route uh, and find out where you're approximately located. It won't give us your house address, of course but it will allow us to know if you're in Toronto, if you're in Barrie, uh, things like that. So uh, the information that's going to be stored there, unless you're entering information yourself into the, the, the form, if you will, uh, on the website and then it's storing that in the cookie, but in that case, you're, you're willingly providing that information anyways, so uh, we have to take that into account. So I'm just looking here for a Firefox uh, plugin that will protect against cookies. So let's just take a quick look, and of course our um, operating system over here, if you don't mind Tyler, I'm just going to skip over and take a look. What this is asking us now, just in case you're ever going to do the step-by-step, -step, is just going to install our bootloader, and we want to use Grub. The other option is Lilo. Grub is basically the menu that you see when you first turn on your computer. Do you want to run Windows? Do you want to run Linux? Do you want to run it in uh, a protected mode, or how do you want to do it? So that's just, it's essentially just the menu that you see when you first turn on the computer. Windows users may not be familiar with that, because usually you turn on your computer and you, you just see the Windows XP and, uh, uh, logo come up right on your screen. But this gives us the option uh, to have a menu when we first turn on our computer. It's great for dual booting and things like that. And then enabling a ACPI uh, allows you to use advanced uh, power management, so that's fine to leave active on most new computers. So we're just going to hit next again. I've left all the settings the same as they were. And it's asking me for my default. I just want to install uh, in, install my default as just loading the Linux boot kernel, which means the default option is going to be just Linux. We've already discussed what root is versus the, the guest user. Uh, so this is prompting for a, a root password. Make sure this is something that you'll remember, but that's safe enough that nobody's going to guess it, because with the root password, anyone could do anything to your computer. Uh, without it, they can't do anything, essentially, because Linux is such a well-secured environment. 
Now this is asking me for my user account. So this is going to be my regular user. So this is the one I'm going to use when I'm... And I shouldn't type and talk at the same time. I'm fine. Eh? <laughs> this is the user account that I, I'm going to want to use when I'm surfing the internet, when I'm checking my email, when I'm just doing my MSN and things like that. And now it's going to ask me if I want to add another user. If you have a family and you want to add more than one user, that's great because Linux kind of puts all the users in individual kind of groups. Uh, like your, your user account becomes almost its own computer. So because you can't mess up someone else's user account, if you set up your, your children as uh, having their own user accounts, if they, whatever they do to their account will not affect the other users on, on the computer. So it's very great for sharing the computer because uh, it gives you that you know, peace of mind that, uh, that things aren't going to break if one person breaks their login. So in this case, it's just me. I don't need to do anything. And it's just telling me that everything is done. It's ready to uh, reboot my computer, and we're good to go. So we're just going to let that reboot and eject the CD. Okay, Tyler, I'm just looking at a message here from Phil, and Phil is saying that uh, the Firefox can clear private data. Of course, uh, that's, uh, and he mentions here, it's tools, clear private data, uh, or control shift delete will also do it. And, uh, and that, of course, gives you the options. That will give you a list of things, of items that you can clear out, including your cookies. And I know you're, I'm just realizing you're looking at the back of my head here. How's that? <laughs> um, so, and Phil is just reminding us that, uh, that within that dialog you have the option of clearing out your cookies. So, thank you, Phil. All right. I'm just going to reboot that computer here. If you'd like to give me a phone call, lines are open. The number to call is 705. 739-1056. Okay, so I'm just looking at, uh, at this Google find that I've got for you, Tyler. I'm going to just drop you a link, Tyler, and just see if this is kind of what you're looking for. What this is, is a program that, uh, that will protect against JavaScript stealing your cookie information. So I'm just ejecting that CD, and the uh, computer is just prompting me, the PC Linux OS computer is prompting me to press enter once the medium is removed. So I hit enter, and that's going to reboot. And within about a second, we're going to be in our brand new PC Linux OS desktop, and that is installed directly on the hard drive. So now we're going to have full speed. The computer that I'm installing this on, it should be noted, is a uh, Intel Pentium 4 uh, Prescott. Now there's the grub menu that I was describing. That's what uh, allows us to choose what we want to load. In this instance, it doesn't really matter to have it, but if we ever want to do a dual boot, it's very handy that we can just select Windows XP right there. Um, so it's a, a Pentium 4 Prescott, which is a later model uh, Pentium 4 and it's got 512 megs of RAM and the key to this computer is its video card. I put in an AGP 7600GS uh, NVIDIA card and that's basically just a relatively inexpensive but $150 Canadian card and that card gives us the 3D acceleration that we need in order to do the fancy barrel uh, 3D uh, desktop that we want to use. Okay, so I'm going to click on my root account because I want to do some administration before I'm ready to do anything uh, like surf the internet. Oh, and I went and typed root. Remember that we need to type in the password that we entered during the installation here because this is now the real system. So you'll see that the system loads quite a lot faster now uh, than it did when, when it was on the CD, obviously. This is the first time it's loaded. It's going to bring in all the drivers and things like that. It's already detected all of our hardware. Unlike Windows, and I, and I don't like to say that, but Linux uh, is uh, basically everything is self-contained within the kernel, so you don't um, have to install too many drivers, if any at all. So here we are. We're right under our system. We've got our base applications, including our uh, Office suite, which just gives us a ton of things, including word processor, spreadsheets, basically everything and of course Firefox and things like that. So 
that's just to demonstrate that we're online and connected. First thing that we want to do though is we want to get our NVIDIA graphics card running. And the, the, the thing with video cards is that the graphic card manufacturers don't want to release their drivers to the public domain, to the GPL. And so they've actually made it so that you have to download their drivers manually if you want to, to uh, install them. PC Linux OS and other uh, Linux operating systems have made it quite easy to get those drivers, but by law, they're not allowed to include them literally in their operating system. But of course, with an internet connection, we can get access to those drivers without problem. Phone lines are open at 705-739-1056. just asking the purpose of a three-dimensional desktop environment um, and what we're looking at today is the Barrel Project's 3D desktop environment which as you're going to see now you can see my screens here kind of uh, in front of me and basically what I can do is I can spin these screens around in a 3D virtual world and you can see basically I've got one desktop two desktops three desktops four desktops and what this does for me Phil is this gives me the opportunity, if you've ever used an operating system with a flat um, desktop, uh, like just one screen, you, you realize that um, it can get very cluttered with applications down in the taskbar. Things just get absolutely, you know, if you're, if you're a productive user, if you're a web developer or a programmer, you know that you've always got to have a lot of programs open at the same time. That can be a real hassle if you're running one of those desktops. So with the 3D operating system, with the 3D desktop, uh, you're able to spin that around throw something else up on another desktop and it's basically like if you've got four desktops it's, it's almost uh, akin to having four different computers uh, so you can just load things up and with virtualization technology which we're going to be introducing next week into this new computer that we're working on uh, you can actually have multiple operating systems on the different sides of the desktop so for example you can use the Linux operating system for your web surfing your email and your MSN and programs like that um, so that you're not susceptible to viruses, so that you're not um, going to have to worry about spyware and adware and having to buy into uh, licenses for antivirus products and things like that. But then you can spin around that cube and have a nice Windows XP desktop up there so that you can run the programs that you want to run if you need Photoshop, say for example, that will, you know, that can be run natively in Linux, but you may prefer to run it directly in Windows. So that gives you that opportunity. Okay, and Phil is mentioning here that he actually had Barrel installed uh, for a while and found that it did not increase his productivity. So, uh, Phil, what is it that, uh, now you're a technician, um, do you do any program, do you often have a lot of programs open? Uh, Tyler is asking if the Barrel software will work with any distribution of Linux, and uh, essentially yes, Tyler. It, it, I mean, Linux is is uh, basically the kernel of the operating system, and then you've got different derivatives from uh, like different uh, desktop. Uh, you've got your KDE and your GNOME interfaces, and and so there's different software on top of the Linux kernel. Um, Barrel is just one of those pieces of software, so. Uh, with a little bit of with a little bit of knowledge, you can get that to work on basically any Linux des desktop operating system. Um, it just may be a little bit of a different process. PC Linux OS, which is what we're uh, working with today, basically eases the process because it's included. And there's other Linux operating systems that include it as well. But Barrel can, in fact, be installed on basically any Linux desktop. Becca is asking if. If she uses Linux instead of Windows, will she still be able to run all of her programs and software? 
Do you have any programs in mind, Becca? Is there anything in particular that you're thinking of? Just before I jump into that question, because that is a big question. Tyler's asking if Barrel works on top of KDE or GNOME. Tyler, uh, Barrel is like an overlay, and I don't want to use that word because I know I'm going to get a whole bunch of emails and people are going to say, no, it's not an overlay. Um, but yes, um, basically you've got your GNOME environment, uh, and then you're going to be, Barrel is going to give you the effects in addition to that. You're also going to be able to use um, the window decorators that Barrel provide, things like that. But you can still choose, do you want Barrel, or pardon me, do you want GNOME or do you want KDE? And then Barrel goes on top of that. Uh, Ubuntu is a GNOME-based uh, uh, operating system. Kubuntu is a KDE-based operating system, which is more familiar to the Windows users because it's got the taskbar at the bottom. And then uh, there are some other derivatives as well. Becca is asking about Photoshop, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint. It should be mentioned that Linux has a lot of great programs that are compatible uh, and in some cases even superior to the Microsoft counterparts or the counterparts that are available for Windows. And a good example of that is the OpenOffice suite. If you've ever used OpenOffice, you know that it's, com it's a word, word processor, PowerPoint compatible. You can open all of the Microsoft Office files um, and you can open your PowerPoint presentations that you've created on a Microsoft Windows environment. But you also have the ability to open uh, WordPerfect files, OpenOffice files, StarOffice files, uh, you get uh, things in addition to uh, the Microsoft counterpart. So, uh, so that should be mentioned that, um, oh, and I'm getting, <laughs> okay, I'm going to come back to some other people here. Um, so you should understand that there are alternatives, and that's usually the best way to go. However, there are products out there that will allow you to install Microsoft Windows applications natively into Linux, and basically that means that you can, um, you can drop uh, programs like Microsoft Word or PowerPoint directly into Linux without having to use uh, virtualization at all. Programs that are available, um, of course the core project is called Wine, uh, which is uh, usually misunderstood as being a Windows emulator. It's not in fact an emulator, it just gives you the layer, uh, basically like an API to allow you to, uh, to access Windows applications and run executable files like .exe files within Linux. So using that, you can usually install programs like Word and PowerPoint, basically like the Office applications. Items like Photoshop sometimes are a little more trickier. Uh, that's really bad grammar, I understand that. But, uh, but Photoshop, because of just certain ways that it uses the Windows interface, um, it's becoming more and more difficult to run natively on Linux. Uh, older versions, uh, such as version 7, you can install basically very simply using, uh, using Wine. Uh, there's other products like Cadega, um, Transgaming makes it an excellent program based on Wine as well that allows you to install Windows games into Linux, but uh, Photoshop, any of the newer versions tend not to run very well, and that's just because of the, the interaction between Linux and the Windows application. But most Windows applications, uh, and I, uh, most as in you know your desktop applications that you'd be familiar with, are going to run just fine under Linux. But Again, next week we're going to be dealing with virtualization. What that gives us is the ability to actually install Windows directly into Linux. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but that actually means that we can be working within Linux, and if we need Photoshop, we can actually boot into Windows without ever leaving Linux. And then we can spin our cube around. You're going to get to see that next week. Phil's opinion is that KDE is way cooler than GNOME. <laughs> So was I able to adequately, adequately uh, answer your question about Arrow Project? And I understand that you didn't find it as product uh, to be, you know, an increase in productivity. I'll be honest. I have I found the exact opposite. Um, I would never be able to go back to just plain GNOME or plain KDE or Windows. Um, now that I've been using Barrel Project for, uh, well, I think since pretty much since its inception, since. Compiz and Barrel originally forked out, uh, so that's been quite a quite a while. Um, <coughs> I found it uh, to really increase my productivity, and I think that's because I do have several applications open at once. So to have multiple desktops really gives me a lot more working space. Phil is 
was also mentioning that he's had some problems recovering his 3D desktop uh, from suspend on the laptop. That could be something to, uh, to do with your video drivers, most likely, configuration in your xorg.conf file. Did you have your latest drivers installed at the time, Phil? And by that, I mean if you're using an NVIDIA chipset, not the NV driver, but the actual NVIDIA driver. So Phil, you actually had an Intel video chipset, integrated video, um, and you, under you are in the understanding that it is, you know, you say it's a cheap Acer laptop. Um, one thing, Intel chipset is basically, the, you know, you're looking at great for working uh, in office productivity applications, things like that. But when you start going into 3D, you've got to look at an ATI or an NVIDIA chipset. Personally, my recommendation is NVIDIA. Uh, I've had much better success with the uh, entry level uh, video cards from NVIDIA than I have with ATI. Um, so that's something that you would definitely have to look at. You, you, can't, you can't really blame that problem on the uh, uh, ATI is Canadian, he reminds me. Yes, I know but we're interested in performance as well as supporting our Canadian economy. Is that wrong of me to say? <laughs> Phil, Tyler is asking why you feel that, um, that KDE is better than GNOME. Personally, Tyler, as we're waiting for Phil to answer that question, um, I started out using, when I first jumped into Linux, I was using the Linspire operating system, as you know, it, it was Lindos back then, um, and it was KDE based. I always, I think what I, what I personally didn't like about KDE was whenever you click on an application, you get the loading whatever application, if you click on Firefox, this is, you know, um, basically you're waiting for Firefox to load for just a few moments and then it pops up. I'm just the kind of guy, I like instant, I like things to be really, really fast, and I don't like to see little things that say coming soon. Uh, I don't like going to a website and say, you know, under construction. I don't like when my operating system tells me I'm loading the program. I, uh, I prefer it just to load and, and come up extremely fast. With GNOME, you don't get those little kind of things, and that was kind of why I made the switch to GNOME originally. And I just, you know, they both have their ups and downs. KDE is a very attractive desktop. Uh, but again, you're going to be trying different things such as uh, the barrel project, so you may not, uh, you may not even need the, uh, the KDE for the beauty. You can use GNOME and get the same kind of beauty. So um, Now, I know I'm taking a bunch of questions here, but I do want to proceed with, um, with installation of the NVIDIA drivers. But before we do that, I'll just look at, uh, Tyler, I'll look at Phil's response here. He says he finds GNOME to be less configurable. Uh, he likes the integration of KDE applications a lot better, and he likes Copeak. Now, it should be mentioned, Phil, I'm on GNOME right now, and I'm talking to you on Copeak. Uh, and he says he likes that better than Pig Dinner Game. Um, and he likes the video and voice support. So, Phil, I should just remind that, as with any Linux application, you can be installing KDE applications into GNOME and vice versa. There's no problem there. Uh, so this is a this is looks like a software preference, Tyler. He's saying that he likes Contact better than Evolution. Those are two different programs that are kind of uh, Linux equivalents to Microsoft Outlook. Um, and he likes Conqueror better than Nautilus, which is uh, basically your uh, what Windows would call Explorer or My Computer, the way that you navigate your files and the way your desktop looks. So those are all you know reasonable things to say, but don't don't jump into KDE thinking that. Um, that you can't, or don't uh, be afraid of GNOME thinking that you can't install KDE applications because you absolutely can. Like I said, I'm running Copeat right now. Uh, I run Evolution because I prefer it uh, over uh, Contact. So, um. <laughs> so 
So that is just preference, Tyler. And Linux, I think, you know, that's one of the beautiful things about Linux is that you have so much uh, opportunity to share your preference and to customize your desktop. Um, with many op other operating systems, you don't really get that freedom. This really gives you a freedom to configure it the way that you would like. So I'm just going to jump back to our PC Linux OS desktop here. And I did have a problem with Synaptic, which is the program that uh, that allows us to install drivers and programs and things like that, but I, I fixed it. You probably won't encounter the same problem, so it's not a big deal. So now I'm just going to load up this program, which is this icon down here. This is going to allow us to install our video drivers for the NVIDIA chipset. So I'm just going to do a search for NVIDIA, because that's the video card that I have. I have, a an, like I said at the beginning of the show, NVIDIA 7600GS. So I'm going to look at the 97XX driver, which is the um, the driver for newer uh, video cards with the NVIDIA chipset. You can see that this is more for the older uh, GFX cards. All right, so this is the one that I want. So we're just going to double click on that to tag it for installation and then apply our changes. That's going to download directly through the internet all of the drivers that we need. So very cool feature of basically the installation uh, package managers of Linux is that it basically gets everything off the internet. You never really have to put a disk in your drive. So that's pretty handy. Um, Tyler's asking if you can switch between GNOME and KDE uh, without reformatting your computer. The answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, when you start your uh, computer, you have the option of loading any session that you've, you've got installed. It's called a session. Um, so KDE is the session manager. GNOME is the session manager. You can use basically any of the available session managers. Um, I also use Fluxbox and uh, things like that. So, um, so yeah, absolutely, you can do that. And that's just on the fly. going to switch back to the system. I'm not absolutely certain if this took, but we are being prompted to restart the computer now, so we're going to go through with that. So I'm just going to hit OK and reboot the computer. Still haven't taken any calls for our episode one of category five. You can call me up at 705-739-1056. I'd love to hear from you. call in, you'll be able to be heard on the show. If you do call in, please mute the speakers on your computer, just so that we avoid any feedback issues or anything like that. This is a live show. Another question here from Laura Lady uh, with regards to PHP development. She's asking uh, if I could explain PHP and uh, if there's a very basic PHP software for beginners. 
she says she has Enview, uh, but it only addresses changing the website content. Okay, so thanks for the question. I'll do my best to answer that as accurately as I can. It needs to be understood that if you're going to be developing PHP, which is a web-based uh, programming language, uh, people would think along the lines of HTML. And HTML is uh, going to be interpreted by the user's browser, whereas PHP is interpreted by the server. So what that means, because it's a server-side uh, language, and I'm just typing in my password here to get back in now that we've rebooted, if I may. PHP as a programming language is going to be uh, basically run on the server as a program and then the output of that script is going to be sent to the browser. So you can't think in terms of HTML anymore because uh, HTML is basically, you know, what you see is what you get. That's what you're getting with, with Enview. Um, Enview being akin to front page, uh, Dreamweaver, items like that. Um, so there's, I really couldn't say that there's, I mean, other than going with canned scripts, there's not really anything that can ease the, the transition from HTML into PHP other than a lot of studying, uh, because it is a programming language more so than it is a, uh, like an HTML language. Um, you basically you know, would create code that would run pro like a program on the server side and then output information to the, uh, to the user so, uh, in HTML format. So there's really not much that we can do to, to ease that transition. Um, but certainly offering canned scripts, find, and knowing good sources for scripts is a good way to do it as well if you, you know, are just getting started. But it's always good if you have a PHP developer that can assist you, a friend who, uh, who is able to um, give you some advice, walk you through along the way. And you can't really learn, it's not like HTML where you could view web sources because um, by the time you view a PHP source, it's already been processed and it's just the output of HTML, so you're not actually seeing the source of the PHP. So you really have to get down to the code itself, uh, which creates the, uh, the HTML output. But uh, again, if you're online, please message me and uh, give me more details about your question. If there's something specifically that you're looking to do with PHP, maybe I can help. Maybe I can create a script for you. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so we're just, uh, we've rebooted into PC Linux OS here, and uh, now we should have our NVIDIA drivers running. Uh, we're going to find out right now just by going into our control center, which is right here. And we do have a problem. So, and I, I kind of detected this as we were doing the install. I did have a bit of an issue um, with the installation itself. And I'm not, because we're live on the air, I'm not really going to do too much to, uh, to worry about that. Uh, but let's see if we can at least get this running in a 3D operating system if the programs are installed correctly. Um, so I'm just going to end the user session here, which is basically logging out of the computer and then going back to the login prompt. And Tyler, this is going to show you um, where you can change your sessions as well. This is PC Linux OS, and you can see how... Now, I know that that's kind of hard to see um, in the... It's kind of small on the screen capture, but... Um, what I have here is my default, my custom, my KDE, and my failsafe. Um, so GNOME could be an option within that list. And if GNOME was an option, I could actually select GNOME, then I could log in, and it would be GNOME. And then I can come back and I can select KDE, log in, and it would be KDE. So unfortunately, my um, packages did not install correctly. That could be a problem with my, uh, if my internet connection was, was uh, having a problem because of the fact that this is our our first time streaming a show and I know that I'm milking a lot of bandwidth right now so it's likely that that's what the cause is. So we're going to have to come back to this one next week unfortunately. I'd love to show it to you but what I will do just at this instant is just kind of bring up my screens here which I know they're hard to see but you can see again the rotation of the desktop. Now this is exactly what we're going to have on our PC Linux OS system. What I'm running here is Ubuntu uh, but it's going to be identical. So and just looking at the option to run Windows XP on one of these cube faces, what I can do is I can just pull that right up, and here we go. So now I've got my cubes, and Phil, you can see the productivity here, where this is Windows XP loading up. We can see the logo there, and then over here, you know, I've got my Linux desktops. So this is what we're going to be accomplishing with the uh, with the PC Linux OS computer. And there we are. So we're at our 
Windows XP desktop here, and I have access to all of my Windows XP programs. Um, so I have FL Studio 7 installed for when I do music production, and uh, my audio editor, Photoshop, and things like that. So that just gives you a quick demonstration of how that works. Please do call me up at 705-739-1056. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer for you. We've only got about eight minutes left of the show. Outstanding questions that have not been addressed yet? Anything that I've overlooked in the chat form? <coughs> Tyler is interested in the technology behind my production of this show and interested in me sharing my secret sauce. Could that be uh, <laughs> my chicken sauce? Actually, I got a great deal on uh, buffalo chicken wing sauce the other day, $5.99 for a great big tub. So that was pretty awesome. Laura Lady is asking about embedding a music file on a website. She says she has a little generic player that she's currently using, using QuickTime. So I presume using the embed tag within HTML. Wondering if there's a code or a simple method for, uh, for using a simple Flash player. Um, she says, I get tired of looking at the same player all the time. I'd like to be able to have an option of the player's appearance, which is always the same when you embed an MP3 in HTML. Of course, embedding a, an MP3 directly into HTML is simply going to um, load it using whatever program the user has installed to, to, uh, to load that, whether it be Windows Media Player, uh, M Player, or QuickTime is the other example, Real Player even. Um, but that's not a good way to do it because you're then basically forcing the user to download that MP3 file in most instances because you're not using an M3U or a playlist um, which is going to stream the, the sound file. So the difference between streaming and actually linking to an MP3 file or embedding an MP3 file is that with streaming you're actually uh, listening to it as it downloads. So if a user pushes stop halfway through or closes the window you're only having to pay for the bandwidth of half of that file. If you're linking directly to the MP3 file, you're going to have to be, like, uh, basically, if you've got a limit on your bandwidth, uh, you're going to find that, um, you know, if, if somebody clicks on the file, even if they only listen to one second of it, they're downloading that entire file, which is kind of ridiculous when it comes to bandwidth. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are several uh, Flash players that you can get, like this, just an S SWF file for playing MP3s. Uh, what I can do is I have one that comes to mind on my own website at, uh, well, my music website that I use for streaming our MP3s. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually pull that off of my website. I'll put it together into a little zip package for you. It's nothing fancy. It's not customizable appearance-wise. I know that that's kind of what you're looking for. But at least it will give you a stream ability uh, for MP3 files. So I'm going to put that together uh, into a little zip package. I'll put it up on the forum for this show. And, uh, and you can download that there, and if anyone else would like that, that's, that's going to be available to you as well. There's lots of commercial MP3 uh, SWF files as well. Uh, Phil is just mentioning that he uses a Flash script um, to stream online sermons, and he says that it's somewhat configurable. Phil, can you uh, provide us a link for that application? Do you have that readily available? Uh, if not, if, if Phil, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you drop over to tv.robbyf.com and just scroll down to the bottom and click on the forum and just go into today's show and just post the, the link there for all to see, that would be wonderful. We've only got a few minutes left of the show. Of course, if there are questions coming in, uh, I'm happy to stay and, uh, and keep answering them, but uh, still haven't received any phone calls. I'd love to take a call and make sure our systems all work, being that this is our first show. Uh, it's 
So I'll just mention again that we have uh, set up a web-based forum, and so you can actually go to www.tv.robbyf.com. Just scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see a link that says visit the forum. That's a, a service that we are providing to allow you, if you're watching this uh, after the fact, when it's not live, uh, you can go to that forum and ask questions specifically on this show. So if there's something that's that you've seen on today's show or a question that you'd like to expand on or uh, if you want if you have an answer for our, our viewers uh, or a, a question to uh, that is in relation to this program uh, you can visit the forum click onto this show which is episode number one for September 25th 2007 and we'll be happy to uh, be able to answer further questions down the road We have two minutes left of the program. If anyone has any questions, please contact me at 705-739-1056. Or you can also MSN or email me at tv at robbyf.com. And of course, the forums are going to be open this evening starting at 8 p.m. at www.tv.robbyf.com. You don't have to register, I don't believe, but you can give it a go. Just give it a try, Phil. It's our first day, so. You're live on the air on Category 5. Hi, this is Tyler calling in. Hey, Tyler. Just, uh, I don't have a question at the moment, but um, I do have a comment, and I just really wanted to uh, congratulate you on your first successful show. It was really educational. Thank you. We appreciate it very much. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad that this is working out so well for you. Yeah, it looks like uh, everything is working out. And if everyone can hear Tyler's voice, then uh, I guess everything's good. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for your call, Tyler. Yeah, no problem. Have you, a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for your call, Tyler. And uh, it should be noted that this show happens live every single Tuesday night right here from my basement in Barrie, Ontario, and uh, we're going to be broadcasting at 7 p.m. every Tuesday night, and I look forward to uh, answering your questions in the, uh, in the months to come, and we'll see how this goes. And we're getting some great feedback from the forums here, and uh, we've, got, uh, we've got one viewer right now from Australia, and uh, the rest seem to be fairly local. Good to know that, uh, that things are working out there in Australia. <laughs> he says, good day, mate. Good day. Okay, any more questions for tonight? All right, it looks like we are good to go. So thank you again for watching the show, and uh, I appreciate you tuning in. Hope that I've been uh, able to answer some of your questions. We'll be back again next week. I'm going to resolve the issue that we had with the PC Linux OS computer. Uh, it seems to be maybe a, uh, an internet connection issue because we do download a lot of stuff from the internet and of course we're streaming the show through the, that same internet connection. So as I was discussing about bandwidth with uh, internet streaming, you can imagine that I'm, I'm kind of milking it right now. So. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, again, check out the forum at tv.robbyf.com. Make sure you post your comments and questions there, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Thanks. Have a great night.